podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and, and welcome to this Fusion uh, 21 uh, webinar, Building a Safer Future, Navigating uh, the New Landscape, Approaches to Implementation. As many of you will know, this is the second uh, of our Building uh, a Safer Future webinars that we're running uh, this week. There'll be a final uh, reminder that you, it's not too late to book on to tomorrow's uh, uh, webinar as well. And obviously, uh, building safety uh, is, is important uh, to us all. Um, you may not know me, but I'm Andrew Gray, and I've, apologies, I've, I've had one or two IT problems. Hopefully, you can hear me okay, um, but I know you can't see me because of the problem uh, with my webcam. Anyway, Ebony, could we have the next slide, please? Okay, so if you haven't been on GoToWebinar before, just a quick little bit of housekeeping rules. So if you uh, want to see uh, more of the presentation, uh, you can click the orange button and, and minimize the control uh, panel. Uh, if you're having problems with uh, audio, then again, you can change uh, the microphone and, and speaker uh, settings using uh, that, that middle bar. So sometimes if those problems persist, uh, it's the classic switch on and switch off again. So log in and log out uh, often rectifies the problem. And whilst you, the audience, uh, are on uh, mute and, and will unfortunately stay so uh, throughout, we do want to hear from you. So please use the question panel uh, on your, uh, the question box on your panel. Um, and again, we will get through as many questions uh, as we can. So next slide. So, as I said uh, right at the uh, very beginning, uh, building safety is a vital uh, of is, is vital importance to both Fusion 21 uh, and its members. And we've put together this week a series uh, of uh, webinars uh, to in in for that uh, particular area. And I'm going to move on to introduce uh, today's panel. Uh, and we have uh, delighted to have Mark Ashbury, partner uh, at Ridge and Partners. Tony Cahill, Executive Director of Property at the Lib Group, and Phil Woodhead, Category Manager at, at Fusion 21. So a big welcome uh, to all uh, of the panel. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to Mark uh, to go through his presentation. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for taking some time out um, slightly after lunchtime as well. So uh, much appreciated in terms of your uh, time and uh, hopefully contribution. Um, just by background, uh, I am a partner at Ridge in the property consultancy team. So 95% of what we do is in the affordable housing sector. Uh, I'm a chartered building surveyor by background, um, fellow of the RICS and a chartered member of the Chartered Institute of Housing, primarily because I wanted to have a bit more than just bricks and sticks knowledge about housing and uh, the challenges we all face. Um, in terms of agenda, if I could have the next slide, please. So uh, in terms of what um, I'm proposing to cover today, um, uh, set out there in terms of, uh, of, of uh, main headings, etc. The session today is very much geared towards um, trying to be practical, uh, practical steps around the implementation, uh, what we're expecting uh, to become an act of parliament during the course of this year in terms of the draft building safety bill. Um, I am doing a small recap on, on some parts, as you'll see, uh, but as Andrew's already mentioned, uh, there was a session, I think, yesterday on the legislation um, specifically so uh, if you missed that I'm, I'm sure that would be available to members to have a look at that so I'm not going to go into lots of detail on the draft bill uh, and legislation as part of this session. Um, next slide please. Um, just a very sort of brief introduction. Uh, I, I know I have a few friends on this uh, webinar who, who know us very well but uh, for those of the, those of you who don't uh, we are property and construction consultants. Um, it's easier to say what we don't do. We don't do valuation work as such, um, but we are predominantly uh, surveyors, engineers, architects, uh, etc. Um, also, I don't tend to read slides to you, I hope. Um, so I will uh, just assume that everything on there makes sense to you um, 
obviously if you've got a clarification please raise it in the questions and I'll, I'll address it uh, when it's brought to my attention um, so we are multidisciplinary um, all, all around the UK uh, and we have a good mix uh, about 50 50 split between work we do in the uh, public sector and uh, private sector so enough about us uh, next slide please so just really to sort of give a bit of a recap um, on the building safety bill um, many of you will recall the forward to the draft bill um, by Robert uh, Jenrick um, talk, talked about um, the aims of the um, of the draft bill so the Secretary of State for Housing Communities and Local Government as he as he still is um, and obviously in response to uh, the Grenfell uh, tragedy and the um, uh, Hackett report that then came out subsequently to that. Um, so in terms of, next slide please, in terms of the draft bill, and as I said, I'm not going to go into um, the detail of the draft bill. Um, it, it, is, it is available from the, from the session yesterday, um, but those sort of headings on that slide in terms of uh, the sort of the main areas uh, which are covered by the draft bill. Um, it's fair to say it's probably the largest overhaul in the last 40 years or so um, of building construction safety um, and currently applicable um, to new residential multi-occupied high-rise buildings um, but other phases will be will be coming in um, as prescribed by the uh, by the secretary in terms of risk etc so there's obviously a very a focus on new there's a focus on high-rise or high-risk buildings um, but that's not to rule out that other types of buildings won't be brought within the uh, uh, scope of the of the uh, legislation uh, when it becomes law. In terms of potential impact, I think it's an estimate that the draft bill probably affects about 13,000 buildings in, in England. Um, and it is obviously geared to that sort of core message from the government in terms of putting resident safety at the core of both this and other legislation, which I'll briefly touch on as well. Um, it also see, sees that wholesale uh, regulatory reform um, of building control and safety uh, in England and, and, and replacing uh, building control uh, responsibility for higher risk buildings or HRBs. Documentation itself, as, as you may be aware, quite long, about 334 pages and about 150 pages of guidance. Um, but even with that volume, uh, as I'll come on to talk about in a moment, uh, there's still a great deal of uncertainty and reliance on secondary legislation etc so uh, despite its length and volume um, it's still got quite a few areas that still need clarification so in, in summary the, the draft bill really has sort of quite a dramatic impact on building owners and and leaseholders um, and also will be uh, still remaining health and safety legislation um, and uh, things like CDM, Health and Safety at Work Act, etc., obviously still remaining in place. So this is supplementing that. Uh, in terms of its timetable, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, documentation uh, was issued in July of last year, as I've, I've mentioned, um, and is currently sort of within its consultation stage. Um, obviously, at the same time as the bill's um, uh, been published last year, um, we've had the Grenfell inquiry um, ongoing, but that's obviously been um, greatly affected by COVID uh, and the pandemic. So that phase two of the inquiry in terms of actually examining the causes of the fire, um, et cetera, which, which started in 2020, um, are likely to continue through um, the remainder of this year. So a, a phase two report is probably unlikely to be published until 2022. Um, as I said, state on the uh, slide there, the intention is that um, the bill will be passed into law during um, this year. Um, however, um, that that just means it becomes a, sort of an act of parliament. Um, but there's also a lot of other uh, information and secondary legislation which will be required. And as you can see, it, it's been scrutinized um, by the Housing Communities Local Government Committee, um, and they were quite critical uh, about some of the lack of detail um, and particularly reliance on unpublished uh, secondary legislation. So the committee is actually 
recommended that when the bill is introduced to Parliament, um, this lack of detail is rectified so that uh, the likes of the construction and our own sectors, etc., can plan with a bit more certainty um, around this new regime. Um, the committee also uh, suggested that there is more clarity be, uh, to be provided on when the new regime will come into effect uh, and including the secondary legislation, um, as opposed to simply saying that the, the Act of Parliament will, will come in during the course of this year. So uh, there is expected to be a sort of transitionary period, uh, particularly um, uh, for, for the likes of us who are dealing with existing stock rather than new build or, or uh, construction that's currently um, happening at the moment. Um, but it's expected that there'll be probably a sort of two year uh, transitionary period um, by which time things that I'll come on to talk about uh, would need to be in place for complex uh, multi-occupied uh, residential buildings. Could I have the next slide please? So that's just of a recap and very very brief I haven't gone into to the detail of the act um, or the draft bill rather uh, in terms of what it contains. Um, one of the key things and obviously driving this presentation in terms of implementation is that statement there by uh, Dame Judith Hackett in terms of it's not necessary for us to sort of wait for legislation uh, to, to arrive before we start thinking and planning and uh, getting ourselves uh, ready for this, so being prepared. Um, next slide, please. So what I've done uh, is, uh, as per the agenda, I've just um, sort of set out some of the things that uh, we as Ridge are helping both local authorities, housing associations, etc., in terms of getting ourselves ready uh, for for the legislation. Um, so I've, I've split these into headings. So I'm starting with people and training because part of the crux of the uh, Hackett review and the feedback was was around the culture. Uh, for those of us who are grey enough and long in working in the construction industry for a long time, we all know about the sort of culture and uh, and the way that the industry works and the comments made by Dame Judith Hackett about the race to the bottom, you know, cost cutting, value engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, the people and training aspect um, in terms of, you know, the potential impact of the bill, um, uh, etc. That's not just, you know, those of us who are, you know, sort of working in, in, the, in the sector, whether we're housing professionals or we're consultants or contractors, etc. Um, but we have to think of a wide range of stakeholders um, that to different degrees need to understand um, what the impact of this bill is. And that includes residents, of course, so both tenants and leaseholders. So it's important um, that, that we get that cultural shift and you're probably aware of the building safety future, uh, building a safety, uh, building a safety, safer future charter, sorry, um, in terms of the ability to, 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 to sign up and be part of that uh, proactive step to, to sort of start um, uh, making this cultural shift happen. Um, obviously, we've had early adopters as part of some of the pilot stages, etc. Um, but, you know, housing providers, local authorities, uh, health associations, consultants, contractors, etc. Um, varying, varying different types of uh, organisations can sign up to that charter with, with a view to shifting um, hearts and minds, etc. So the, the people in the training piece really needs to go around that sort of cultural shift understanding the impact on uh, different stakeholders on their roles on their responsibilities obviously the act uh, so the draft bill is looking at introducing specific roles and responsibilities in respect of higher risk buildings so understanding what that means but there's also aspects of things like governance um, and you know more uh, understanding within organ an organization on where it is in terms of um, being able to comply with the uh, provisions of the draft bill and what's, what processes need to be in place to be able to demonstrate and evidence um, that certainly as far as the prescribed buildings are concerned at the moment that uh, everything is being done um, to, to meet the requirements of the bill. So there needs to be transparency of information uh, between teams both within organisations and externally. Uh, they're going to need to be sort of uh, evidenced and auditable um, to demonstrate uh, how information is being shared uh, and probably uh, incorporated within strategy documentation etc which I'll come on to in a moment. 
any sort of failings around um, these sorts of areas in terms of governance can lead to um, uh, the regulator for social housing um, downgrading organisations. Um, so you know, it is it is, it is key, uh, albeit that that shouldn't be the, the key driver for for, for um, doing this sort of stuff. Um, there needs to be training around uh, duty holders uh, to understand, you know, how they discharge their uh, their obligations, uh, how they appoint competent persons to the role of accountable person and uh, and the building safety managers. Um, they, you will recall, um, parts of the Building Act 1984 uh, were amended uh, or are planned to be amended by the draft bill. Um, and that duty holders uh, must ensure all appointees and prescribed persons meet and demonstrate competency requirements. Um, you'll also be uh, aware of the need to appoint the building safety manager. Um, a lot of uh, debate around whether that's uh, an individual, uh, uh, a couple of individuals, uh, bearing in mind it deals with both very technical uh, almost facility management type knowledge on a building, as well as being responsible for doing the resident uh, consultation and uh, and and uh, stakeholder input, etc. So whilst they're responsible for day-to-day -day management of fire and uh, structural safety in building, um, it, this nominated individual might have sort of a dual dual a role split between dual people um, to cover the uh, different sort of needs and requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So I meant to mention in terms of the competencies, there has been um, uh, working groups and uh, publications by the uh, organisations like the Construction uh, Industry Council on the competency requirements for things like building safety managers, etc. Uh, and there are still um, recommendations for further information and, and guidance to be given in terms of uh, outlining what those nominated individuals what sort of skill sets, et cetera, they should have. Um, the other aspect into the, um, uh, the people and training bit um, comes down to the roles of those uh, sort of uh, individuals uh, stroke responsibilities outlined on, on this slide. So I think in terms of uh, higher risk buildings, um, the building safety regulator will become the building inspector going forward. Um, so that's uh, quite a big change from uh, developers being able to use their own approved inspectors or lo using local authority. Um, so again, um, we need to be, make sure that that is understood within our own teams, um, those who are involved in either new build, which I'm not focusing on today, but certainly refurbishments and any sort of large scale works that are undertaking to uh, existing buildings. Um, you're probably aware that there's a, a requirement at uh, the different gateways within a new build process uh, or refurbishment project uh, in terms of information that needs to be uh, provided. So the gateway one at the planning application stage, gateway two at the end of design or REBA stage four, and then gateway three uh, at the end of uh, construction phases uh, five to seven. So that new gateway certification uh, process um, needs specific adherence and formal processes to check design etc so not only do the likes of region partners need to understand that in terms of our principal designers our architects engineers etc um, and those those dealing as uh, employers agents or contract administrators we need to be fully aware of what's within this bill and therefore how that can impact on um, uh, you know our, our scopes of responsibility and what we will be required to do uh, under the new under the new act, uh, particularly in terms of obtaining uh, occupation um, for for new buildings or refurbished buildings, so all of that uh, again is further training as far as um, people are concerned. Um, there's also you know obviously the impact on things like professional indemnity insurance, uh, which anyone who's recently renewed their PII will realise that market is is changing uh, significantly, uh, and the availability of cover and the um, the restrictions to cover that is provided. So uh, it's important to to understand all of those sort of aspects that are going on, um, and as a result of uh, Grenfell Hackett and this uh, this and other legislation that's uh, on the way. Um, I think in terms of uh, the just 
final thing really is leading into uh, some of the information that's required and collating information. I think it's important for the training to cover things like the requirements of the uh, building safety case reports um, and what's involved in those. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those um, in a moment. So that's the sort of the people and the training bit. Uh, next slide, please. The next part um, is, is around uh, the reflection in your um, strategies um, in terms of how they need probably revisiting, uh, updating and refreshing. Um, so by those, I, I mean uh, things like fire strategies for individual buildings. Um, so obviously, under, you know, that SAS strategy that sets out how all the different elements in a, in a building work together. Um, things like compartmentation, walls, fire doors, um, uh, what contractors need to do in terms of following policies and procedures for working in certain types of building. Um, so there's there's a lot that probably needs to be re revisited and updated um, to reflect the requirements of uh, of the draft bill. Um, there's the obvious uh, reference back to particularly fire related policies, management plans, procedures, processes. Um, but obviously not forgetting that um, it's not just, just about fire, there can be links obviously into other associated uh, compliance areas, so lifts, uh, electrical, gas, etc. Um, and how they have uh, potential risks um, to fire uh, and how those risks within the, each of those compliance areas can be uh, mitigated uh, to reduce any risk. Uh, in terms of the buildings, uh, high rise, higher risk buildings in, at the moment. So they, they all need um, uh, sort of reviewing, uh, updating and, and setting out really, particularly within the management plans, um, what, the, what the approaches are going to be and how practically these, uh, these uh, requirements um, of the draft bill are going, to be, are going to be implemented and how that obviously aligns to the policies uh, which, which are put in place. It's not all about this draft bill either. Don't forget, uh, in, in terms of strategy update, the building regulations, part B changes that happened in 2020. Uh, so reducing the height threshold for the provision of sprinklers uh, down from 30 meters to 11 meters. Um, also um, the wayfinding signage, et cetera. So there, was, there were changes in the building regulations um, that if they haven't already been reflected in uh, in policies and strategies should be. Um, there is also in parallel with the um, uh, with the draft bill, um, the uh, clarification of the scope of the regulatory reform fire safety order 2005, um, for, uh, specifically for multi-occupied buildings of any height uh, with the clarifications uh, to who is responsible for managing fire risk uh, in, in multi-occupied residential buildings and the, the inclusion within that of external wall cladding and common areas. Um, so there are provisions within that for other things such as uh, regular inspection of lifts uh, and reporting results of that to the local fire brigade uh, under the rescue services, um, ensuring that evacuation plans are reviewed and regularly updated and that PEEPs are in place for residents who um, don't have that ability to evacuate, so personal evacuation plans, um, ensuring that fire safety instructions are provided to residents uh, in a form they can reasonably be expected to understand and ensuring that uh, individual flat doors uh, where, where the external walls of the building have unsafe cladding comply, comply with current standards. And unfortunately, we, we've had an incident very recently of inspecting fire doors with our BRE accredited inspectors um, that looked at fire doors that were installed about a month ago. And unfortunately, they have failed. Um, so you can't take uh, you can't take for granted that newly installed um, fire safety uh, precautions necessarily have got you into uh, into the position you'd hope they would have done. So that's sort of a quick whistle stop in terms of strategies and the sorts of things that we're looking at and helping clients with with uh, in terms of updates and uh, where to reflect the approaches and the sort of best practice approaches for uh, what's coming in terms of legislation. If I could have the next slide please. So in terms of you know understanding that um, we also need to be clear in terms of for, for individual uh, clients that we work for is it, almost a well where are you now 
uh, type analysis. Uh, it sounds very obvious, um, but in all my years, which is I think over 17 now in terms of uh, undertaking large scale stock condition surveys, etc. Um, the day that we have an address list which is completely fully accurate and up to date um, has yet to come. Um, so there is always some degree of questioning and gaps within uh, um, clients sort of details of their stock um, and, and the details that they hold. Um, I was at uh, Kensington Chelsea as an interim asset manager for a while and in the immediate aftermath of Grenfell, I came in after Grenfell, um, uh, getting information in relation to other high-rise buildings uh, was quite problematic. I think probably because the focus had always been on, on other types of initiatives and legislation, whether it was decent homes, etc. So understanding and analysis of portfolio, the simple questions around where is your, where is your high-risk uh, buildings, um, and and simple things like knowing knowing the height of buildings are they measured in accordance with the uh, guidance provided in approved document B. Um, but I think it's understanding uh, a number of uh, um, details that that golden thread that has uh, uh, come from the Hackett review. So it, it's that sort of critical review and diagnostic phase almost of understanding what information you have but also anticipating um, the requirements for the building assurance certificate, so what was previously known as the building safety certificate. Um, now the requirements for that in terms of the safety case reports, uh, other prescribed information around mandatory occurrence reporting systems, uh, demonstrating information that's been provided and the resident engagement strategies. Um, it's understanding whether you have got that sort of information um, and I've given a couple of examples on the slide in terms of the things that people um, need to be uh, thinking about. So in terms of the, 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 the suggested safety case contents, we're working with a number of uh, clients at the moment in terms of putting together templates um, for those uh, safety cases for existing buildings. Um, so understanding, A, is it high risk building? Um, obviously at the moment, the focus is on high rise buildings. So uh, six, six stories, 18 meters plus, but you know, it is likely over time that that will probably come down and other complex buildings, particularly where you have elderly residents, et cetera, may then start to fall uh, within the remit of, of the act um, uh, once it's in, in, in law. So understanding complexity, height, et cetera, um, other, other more straightforward things in terms of understanding of responsibility and ownership, um, uh, building details, always a, always a challenge, particularly with uh, high rise buildings in terms of doing uh, things like structural or refurbishment works. Uh, can you put your hands on um, as built drawings, uh, any drawings, photos, uh, details of assets, etc. You need to be obviously liaising with the fire safety authorities, uh, who they are, undertaking um, fire risk assessments, assessing materials, etc. Um, have you got information around structural safety? Anyone with particularly with uh, large panel system uh, buildings, uh, the likes of uh, Ronan points, so those risks of disproportionate collapse, particularly with um, uh, gas gas powered heating systems, etc. Um, have we got that type of information, uh, stock condition information, including uh, the housing health and safety rating system, HHSRS, um, and, and you know, there's quite a lot of other, other information. So that sort of data, where are you now, is really around thinking, what are we going to need to provide to be able to apply for the building assurance certificate uh, uh, you know, it, when the retrospective requirement comes in so that actually residents can continue to occupy a building uh, and that we've we've demonstrated we've got that information we've we've mitigated the risks etc so that's kind of that diagnostic stage the next stage uh, next slide please is then obviously having done that diagnostic stage is then looking at how you can fill those gaps in uh, so, uh, you know, there'll be a number of exercises uh, that, that could be undertaken, uh, everything through stock surveys to um, looking at complex mechanical and electrical installations, understanding where they are, etc. 
Um, and that diagram on the right, which I appreciate is probably a little bit small to see, uh, has come from our, our BIM team uh, in terms of part of their level two 3D modeling and, and, and understanding where various uh, bits of mechanical electrical uh, equipment are, you know, how is that maintained, how is that serviced, uh, have we got the evidence to show that, etc. where are the compartmentation uh, walls, um, etc. So, you know, doing specialist types of surveys um, and uh, considering asset tagging as well which is is very prominent now certainly with uh, projects we're doing on the uh, on uh, automated fire detection equipment and things like that um, and also don't forget uh, in terms of those those records and uh, those of us who had to do the submissions to MHCLG on cladding and insulation materials as part of that delta upload so filling in those gaps um, some of those activities next slide please um, and then also coming on to probably more of the intrusive type things. Uh, so again, our structural engineers have, have been knocking seven bells out of a number of high rise buildings, um, uh, looking at um, LPS, but also just the uh, condition of concrete, uh, reinforcement, et cetera, uh, doing, doing tests on different types of cladding, insulation types, et cetera. So if that information doesn't exist, it's, it's going out there and, and filling those gaps in. And certainly, uh, we have a number of ongoing intrusive type four FRAs uh, being undertaken at the moment, both within the housing sector and, and outside the sector, um, and looking at compartmentation reviews. So it's all those sorts of things that we need to be able to uh, decide whether we have got sufficient information that's evidence and robust. Uh, obviously, some information uh, you can have might be out of date. You may not you may not have so much such confidence in it. So it's really going through a sort of systematic approach to saying, well, what are we expecting to have to provide? And can we get ahead of the curve now by by either examining existing records or indeed um, getting some boots on the ground to to go and have a look at that in, in more detail? Um, OK, the next slide, please. Um, Obviously, resident, the, the resident engagement strategy specifically stated within the uh, within the draft bill, um, and I, I put some things, uh, just some pointers up here in terms of how uh, clients are starting to think about and develop that engagement strategy. Um, I think it's important uh, that you know, as a sort of a customer service thing, we recognise that you know things have moved on, and COVID has demonstrated as well that there are so many different types of media and ways of communicating with uh, with uh, residents that it's not all about just printing newsletters and sending them out anymore. Um, you know, there's much more to uh, to uh, the methods of engagement uh, than than the old uh, letters and newsletters type thing. Um, it's important, um, obviously, that the safety regulator, one of the three committees it, it's um, setting up is a residence panel. Um, but for each of you, in terms of, you know, you'll have your own type of resident forums and ways of consultation, etc. cetera. Um, but obviously, the, uh, both the draft bill, but also the uh, social housing white paper, um, very much focused on, on that uh, safety of residents and the voice that was absent um, you know, around the time of the Grenfell disaster. Um, so having that voice and, and listening and taking action and being accountable for that. So there's a few sort of, uh, sort of pointers there in terms of what to think about with resident engagement and what that strategy should contain. Um, it's important that it is, it is effective, uh, it is tailored to their requirements and there are regular updates to it. Um, we, we've started looking at handbook updates where, where people still issue resident hand, handbooks. Um, it, it's also important to stress, obviously, within the bill, there are those express duties uh, placed on residents as far as um, high risk buildings are concerned. So keeping property in good states of repair, cooperation with the building safety manager, uh, not damaging fire safety works uh, or equipment. Um, so you know it's 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 a it's a two way thing, um, but but obviously focus very much has been on you know uh, the voice listening and uh, and making sure that that uh, safety is put at the heart of everything we do. Okay, so that's sort of the resident engagement piece, um, and just sort of finally, um, next slide please. Um, 
it's important that whilst we have an awful lot in our sector around fire safety and rightly so um so with the with the uh, with the um reform to the fire safety order um with this draft bill um obviously the inquiry ongoing etc um but it's important to not forget, um, as if we could, um, about the various other plates that, that we in the sector and particularly asset managers are, are obviously dealing with at the moment. We're spinning a lot of plates at the moment. Um, so it's important, I think, to bear in mind and make sure that there's a holistic um, type of approach taken uh, in terms of, okay, we're dealing with fire safety, but at the same time, we also need to consider maybe how things uh, could also be used to help achieve some of those objectives uh, uh, set out on that slide. So many clients that we're working for um, have got the net zero carbon target at 2030, um, and that is a significant challenge um, at the same time as uh, dealing with high risk buildings and the requirements from the draft bill. Um, so it's, it's making, you know, making those uh, decisions not just with blinkers on in terms of fire safety is concerned, but also thinking about net zero carbon, the wider um, sort of sustainability um, uh, topic, which uh, we, we as Ridge are heavily involved with in terms of our own sustainability team and uh, our net uh, our, uh, retrofit coordinators and assessors. Um, so it's, it's having an eye and involving them as part of the sort of broader conversation to make sure we don't miss a trick really uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the investment we make in the stock and, and how we address requirements of both this draft bill other legislation and uh, other agendas within our sector next slide please so that's it from me in terms of uh, just a, a sort of summary hopefully that's that's giving you some pointers uh, and some some thinking in terms of how to uh, be considering where you are now and what 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 steps need to be taken uh, specifically around high risk buildings but uh, fire safety generally so i will hand back to yeah, andrew yeah thank you and yeah thank thanks, you for listening. thanks Mark, for that um i'm going to deal with uh, questions uh, at the end so i'm going to go straight on um, to introduce Tony Cahill, and, and, and in some respects, the uh, what you've just mentioned. So here's here's somebody as executive uh, director of Property or Live Group who is uh, going through that uh, that, that current uh, conundrum of, of continuing to wrestle in in, in terms of uh, where the expenditure is. So a, a big welcome, Tony, and uh, again, really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so my name is Tony Cahill. Um, as Andrew just said, I'm Executive Director of Property for Live Housing Group. Um, Live Housing Group is the, the new name um, since April 2020 for what was new, the Housing Trust. We have uh, just over 13,000 homes in and around Nosley and Merseyside. Um, uh, amongst that, we have 12 high-rise buildings, over 18 metres. Um, a couple of high risk buildings of extra care schemes, uh, etc., um, and a whole array of other mid and, and low rise that also come under um, fire safety requirements. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time running through what really um, our journey has been um, so far as a provider of, of social housing. Uh, next slide, please. So. In that short time I'm just going to spend with you, I just want to talk about the approach we've taken over the last few years, um, probably starting back in 2018, and it will become apparent why shortly, um, but also then taking into account the, how we have started to address the changes as they have become uh, apparent in relation to the Building Safety Bill, the Fire Safety Bill, Grenfell Phase 1 findings, um, white paper more recently, et cetera, all of those different things that are coming out um, and asking us cons to consider our approach to um, working with our customers, um, working with them um, and being open and transparent with them, uh, as well as ensuring their, their safety is, is paramount uh, in that approach. Uh, next slide, please. So the starting point of the journey I'm going to describe to you today is not a good one. Um, in 2018, 
uh, Knowsley Housing Trust, as it was at the time, were downgraded to a G3 by the regulator of social housing for fire safety failings. Um, not a good period of time um, for us, of course, as you can well imagine. What had actually happened in real terms is we had effectively been too slow to act to resolve issues that were identified as part of fire risk assessments that we'd had undertaken. We'd not reported those adequately and we'd not communicated well with others as to what we were doing about it. Ultimately, that led to a lack of assurance for the fire service who issued us with a series of fire enforcement notices to ensure that we completed that work within a reasonable period of time. That led the regulator of social housing to undertake an in-depth assessment of us in uh, early 2018. Uh, later that year, uh, they found that um, we were not compliant in relation to governance and downgraded us to a G3. Now, I'm glad to say that we've now been regraded earlier this year uh, to a compliant grade of G2. Um, and that took a lot of work and a lot of time to get to that point. Um, but I was going to share with you the approach we have taken in bringing about the level of assurance that we then had to give to show that we are managing building safety appropriately and how we have also then approached the new requirements as a result of that. So once we had um, understood the challenges that we were facing and we'd received a, a downgrade, we started to put in place an action plan. So next slide, please. So first of all, we decided that we, we didn't know what we didn't know. And we needed to get some assurance ourselves around what the true position of our estate was in relation to building safety. So in 2019, in early 2019, we commissioned a 100% fire risk assessment programme for all of our buildings that required one. High rise, mid rise, low rise, communal buildings, um, every building, over 460 fire risk assessments were undertaken in a four month period. Um, that was a significant piece of work that we commissioned to be undertaken. Um, but no short outcome to that was that we had a whole series of then recommendations that were made as a result of those with what were really probably fresh eyes from fire risk assessors at the time in a post Grenfell environment that started to identify issues that had not previously been raised before. So we had a lot of work to do. Um, I remember the number very vividly. We had 7,330 actions from 460 um, fire risk assessments. Now, the great majority of those were minor in nature. Um, however, dealing with that complex and size and scale of something um, was quite a task. In addition to that, for each of our high rise and high risk buildings, such as our extra care schemes, we developed individual fire strategies for each building that allowed us to assess how we would manage risk in that specific building. And that linked in very closely with our fire risk assessors and the FRAs they undertook and how we would manage those properties going forward. As Marcus said earlier, one of the things that the consequences that will come from um, the building safety bill is that we need to look again now at those strategies and see how they align to the requirements now that, that are coming out of that and keep those things live so that they make sure that we manage risk effectively in those buildings as our requirements change. One of the other and most important things that we introduced, however, at this time was we introduced a compliance management system. We happened to select a, a system called C365. And the compliance management system would manage our fire risk assessments and the resultant actions that would come from those. And it would give us an evidence led approach to statutory compliance for those actions. So the fire risk assessments also upload into our system so they can be viewed live as they are completed. All of the actions that are required from those assessments 
are measured, monitored, evidence is attached to them, whether that be photographic evidence, written evidence, etc. And they are closed down appropriately and reported upon on a weekly basis by a fire risk team. So a real evidence led approach. However, that system, and as Mark said earlier, this isn't just about fire safety alone. This is about all of the other areas that can um, that can create risk within the building. So our um, compliance management system actually monitors 64 separate areas of statutory property compliance that we monitor through that system. All of them live, reviewed on a daily basis by um, many teams, including myself, on a visual basis. And I'm glad to say that most recently, in terms of our certification, we were able to achieve 100% compliance in every area of statutory compliance that we monitored through that system. Um, but that's a daily challenge that we, we try to upkeep and, and, and keep on top of, and we don't treat that lightly. But as I said, undertaking 100% FRAs across our estates, 460 in such a short period of time, led us to a significant number of actions, and ones that we had to then put in significant investment in. We invested over £3 million in an 18-month period in putting in actions um, ranging from, again, the most minor of things through to improvements in compartmentation, through to fire-rated glazing um, in over 300 properties across some high-rise. They were the type of actions that were then coming out of fire risk assessments that would never been recommended before pre-Grenfell. So there was having a significant effect on, on the amount of work we had to do, but we made a commitment to actually deliver that programme and we completed that in the last financial year that's just ended. We also needed to do some work around the failings that we had had in relation to communication, in particular with the fire service. So we put in place a comprehensive communication strategy with the fire service to build a strong relationship with them and to ensure that we saw the fire service as um, someone who would support us and help us and um, not be against us and um, to be open and honest with them, to communicate with them, with them on actions that we were taking that actually we're all required to do under the regulatory form fire safety order anyway, but in a very proactive way and in some cases often for minor mitigating actions that we needed to put in place, but we discussed those with them, agreed those actions and got them on board with what we were doing so that we had their support in the approach we were taking to fire safety. Uh, next slide, please. So along the way of that journey, um, whilst we were undertaking all of that work, we obviously started to hear of the findings that were coming out of Grenfell phase one originally and the initial recommendations that were made by Dame Judith Hackett. Um, Dame Judith was very clear, and Mark said this earlier, she made very clear a point that we should start acting now and not wait for legislation to force us to take action. There were some very simple and clear recommendations made in the Grenfell phase one findings. And let's be honest, they weren't complex recommendations and they weren't difficult to put in place. So not doing them was never an option. So any of the findings that we have been able to implement, we have implemented for some time. Um, there, are, there are things in the building safety bill that require further clarification, further work to do, require other parties to be part of that, such as reporting to the fire service, etc that we need to evolve over time. But anything that was within our power to address, we have already addressed and put in place, and we now monitor through our compliance management system. But in a number of areas, we wanted to go further. One of the learnings that came out of the Grenfell um, tragedy was the challenges that the fire service faced when they arrived on site um, at the fire and the lack of information they had available to them to be able to address some of the issues they identified quickly. So one of the things we've done is work with Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service to cover 
the great majority of the properties we have in our estate. And we have provided them um, a combination of information that meets our GDPR requirements, but provides them the relevant elements of the PEEPs information and the relevant elements of the property information box that we have on site uh, in an electronic format that is then accessible to every fire appliance that they could have that could turn up at one of our high rise or high risk buildings. So that when they're on the way to site, they can be reviewing that data and already have at their fingertips the information they require immediately when they arrive on site. And we did that in conjunction with them. We keep that up to date regularly and provide regular updates to them. We review that on a monthly basis in case there are any changes. That includes things like um, which of our customers' homes would require support to be evacuated. Now, clearly, it's not desirable necessarily for the fire service to want to evacuate a building and um, our properties all retain uh, staple policies through our fire strategies currently. But if that was identified as being required as essential by the fire service, then they would know uh, in conjunction with ourselves immediately through that information who would require support in being evacuated from uh, their homes. Uh, next slide, please. One of the other key outcomes from building a safer future, of course, has been a target to, as I've said, put residents at the heart of a new system of building safety. So how we communicate and how we engage with our customers um, is absolutely paramount. And that involves transparency, clear indications of, of what we need to tell them, how we are performing, etc. So we have developed a new resident engagement strategy that takes into account those requirements. And we'll keep that again refreshed. We don't want to produce a strategy that sits on a shelf for the next three or five years that we don't look at again. We're going to keep that strategy live evolve it as we learn, but also evolve it as requirements from the Building Safety Bill become clear, etc. Um, and all of those areas to make sure that we have encompassed within our approach a real method of true transparent engagement with our customers so they can understand what it is we're trying to achieve and they can measure and monitor our performance. One of the things that was recommended by um, Hackett in the, the Grenfell phase one review was that um, fire risk assessments for um, high rise buildings should be published um, and accessible publicly to our customers. Um, we took some time to make sure that when we provided that information, we provided it uh, appropriately. Everyone who is, is on this event today I'm sure will have reviewed many fire risk assessments in their time. A fire risk assessment can be a very complex document, particularly for a high rise building. It can be very scary when you read it and not necessarily understand what it means. So as well as meeting the requirement to provide our customers with access to our fire risk assessments, we also wanted to make sure that we could give them a simple snapshot review in a summary report that allows them to see the risk rating of their building, the types of risks and actions that were identified by a fire risk assessor when the FRA was undertaken, the timescales that they have set and targeted for us to complete those actions, and whether or not we have done them. So in a simple one-page snapshot, our customers have transparent view of the types of actions that were recommended and whether we've fulfilled our responsibilities in meeting those timescales. Now, fire risk assessors can sometimes be very generous in their, uh, in my opinion, in their timings that they give us to undertake actions. Sometimes they will give us immediate responses, three months, six months or 12 months to complete actions. Um, we set ourselves a target to complete all, all actions where it is practicable to do so within one month. And we look to report that and refresh that information to our customers via our website. And our customers can now, 
from the 1st of April this year um, access our website, input their home postcode and access that summary or FRA information as they feel free. And that's just another one of the steps that we want to start to provide to our customers to give them a truly transparent and open approach in how we, um, we share that information with them. We'd also, of course, like everybody else, probably in the sector, are currently in the process of recruiting a building safety manager that will look to meet our obligations and our requirements for the building safety bill. And that, again, will further enhance the level and depth of communication that we can have with our customers. But we, of course, in the circumstances of COVID-19, have to make sure that that's a multifaceted communication approach, not just face-to-face -face communication, not just written communication, but also digital in its approach as well. So a diverse range of, of dealing with our customers. Um, so next slide, please. So I want to finish my section by just talking about learning lessons. I've enclosed three pictures here on the right hand side of this slide. From the bottom photograph to the top photograph, it spans more than 25 years of time. So it shows it all as a reminder that we haven't learnt lessons from the past at all times. We've now got to do that. And actually the Building Safety Bill should be seen by us as being a motivator for us to make sure we learn those lessons, we address them, and we stop seeing these types of photographs coming to our fore. So there are four things that I would like to finish on that I would recommend anyone to learn from our journey, which, as I said earlier, started at a very low point for us, where we were given a governance downgrade because of fire safety failings, which we recognise openly. The journey we've been on to overcome that and the journey we've been on to try and meet our obligations around the building safety bill, the fire safety bill, etc. And they are to um, request advice and support quickly when it's needed. If we're in doubt or we're not sure, we request advice from our, our providers, our partners on our fire advice, and Ridge are currently our, our providers of support for that. We regularly, and I'm on a meeting this afternoon with them around some further advice over uh, one of our buildings later this afternoon. Request advice quickly and act upon that advice promptly. Do it with valuing money in mind, do it with being approaching things appropriately in mind, but do it promptly. When we do it, do it ensuring that we can evidence our approach to compliance in doing that. I would recommend to everyone I ever meet, the next time that someone in your team says to you, we've done that, say to them, show me. And if they can't show you and they can't evidence it, how do you really know it's been done? So make sure you can evidence everything that someone says they can do. That was one of our failings. Be transparent with customers and stakeholders. The expectations on all of us now through all of those things we've talked about, including the recent white paper, require us to be more transparent and more engaging with our customers. Make sure we do that both the customers and stakeholders, but in a way that they will understand and be able to um, contribute to supporting us in achieving safety in their buildings. And engage regularly and openly with the fire service. Nothing more important in our lessons than be proactive with them at every stage we can be to make sure that they understand where we are and that we are serious about the safety of our buildings. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you for your time. And hopefully that gave you a little bit of an insight into the journey we've been on over the last few years. And I'll hand back over to Andrew. Thank you very much, Tony. That was that was excellent and really, really uh, insightful. And and again, you know, thank you, uh, thank you for your openness and in honesty. And uh, as you said, in, in, in what has been a journey that perhaps didn't start at the place uh, you you wanted to. Um, 
please do keep your questions uh, coming in. Please use the, the question box. I'm, I'm sure as a result of those two presentations, uh, there are a lot more. We, we do have uh, some questions, but I'm now going to uh, pass on to uh, and delighted to, to, to welcome uh, my colleague, uh, Phil. Um, so Phil Woodhead, who's our uh, category uh, manager for compliance. Over to you, Phil. Great, thanks, Andrew. And, uh, and I think we'll just echo the, the thank you for Tony there. I think you were very open and transparent and, and you, you, you're clearly living and doing what you say you do there. Um, and, uh, you know, some, some respects some of the things that you've sort of said and talked about is, is quite brave, but I think it's really good um, that, that you have. And, and, and I think others can certainly learn from, from your journey. Um, so thank you. Um, for me, I've just got a very short segment, which is is to talk about how Fusion 21 helps members such as uh, Live Group and, and others, um, and um, uh, in, to introduce our new building safety and compliance framework. Um, this wasn't put together uh, directly uh, as a sort of response to the building safety agenda. Um, it's a framework for renewal for us, uh, and it's our third generation of this framework. So uh, next slide, please. I think. Thanks. So uh, the, the first point I, I put, and, and I didn't actually know Tony's four ending messages uh, and, and his piece there about seeking advice. Um, you, you know, we put the framework together thinking, you know, there are skills and, and experiences and knowledge that most social landlords will not have within their own organisations. And we recognise that need. So part of the framework for us was around how do we build a supply chain that landlords can access that will, that will plug that gap. Um, so uh, the head, headlines for me, the, the framework launches next Tuesday, we have a webinar on that, so please do, do come along and have a look. Um, we took a step back ourselves and asked ourselves what, what's going to change in the new world, and what do our members need, and, and how can we help them. Uh, and so that first point is linked to our lot five specifically, uh, which is for consultants. Uh, I do have to mention that, that Rich uh, and Mark's team are, are, have been successful in that framework. So there's a sort of an early teaser there for you. Um, uh, it's necessarily why he's here today, but, uh, but, but I think that's good news for Rich uh, and, and, and for members that also need support of, of external advice. Um, in taking that fresh look, we, we've updated the specs, we've updated the pricing documents. Uh, to give you the tools that you need to help manage your contractors and manage your buildings. And, and so it, it, is a, it is a refreshed framework from not completely from ground zero. We, we've taken a, a wheel that was pretty good. Uh, we've taken a couple of corners off it and we approved that. Uh, it's not a whole new wheel from scratch, uh, but, it, but it certainly works. Um, and the, 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 I suppose the last point for me is, and, and it probably touches on some of what Toby said there around data. So one of the things specifically we built in within those requirements actually is around data provision from contractors. So the old model says finish a project, do some installations, uh, and hand over a health and safety file. Uh, and we've all seen in the past how health and safety files aren't always up to date, they don't always land on time. Um, and actually some of the obligations are around the, the format of that information in working with uh, client members to make sure that it's in a format that can be imported into their current systems, adopted and assimilated as part of that building safety case, but also some retrospective obligations that if a landlord changes its model, increases its data requirements two years down the line, that uh, rather than having to start from scratch, they can go back to contractors that have done work, installed things, and ask for that information in a new format. Now, that's not to say it won't come out of cost, but it's got to be far better and far cheaper to get that from the person that installed those systems than uh, trying to do a survey and, and work out some information where the cables run after the fact. Uh, there are some obligation contractors to, to cooperate in that process. So um, that's the sort of headline messages for me for today. So next slide, please, Ebony. Uh, I think my only other message, you see the range of lots that are specifically related to fire safety. Um, Tony there touched on uh, other compliance, so the framework does have lots of respect, stuff, needs, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, this framework complements our other offers, so we do have a DPS for installing sprinkler systems, even though uh, the indications are they, they are not going to be mandatory, um, and a consultant's framework for things like project management, cost management, architects, et cetera, et cetera. But the 
fire safety specific stuff mostly that does it here so um that's all from me um thank you very much for, for, for listening if you want to know more um just on that data side of things we do have another webinar tomorrow from um Clarion talking uh, about 4d data so i'm looking forward to that as well um, but for me that's all thanks so much and um, back over to you andrew Thank you uh, very much, uh, Phil. And, and yes, just a, a, a couple of uh, reminders in terms of uh, tomorrow's uh, webinar. Again, visit our websites. Uh, it's not too late uh, uh, to sign up uh, for that. Uh, and also, uh, again, next week, as, as Phil said, uh, the Building Safety and Compliance Framework launch. So, so just going back to uh, Q&A, and, and we, we've had uh, the first question in, so uh, I'll, I'll address this to the panel, but I'm, I'm uh, perhaps ask uh, Tony uh, to speak about it first and, and, and then Mark uh, and then also Phil. So uh, the first question we've had is around the building safety manager. Again, Tony, you mentioned uh, that you are currently recruiting um, to that role. Uh, and again, the, the question uh, that, that we've had in is basically about that role. It's a multifaceted role. The person needs to uh, needs to have building knowledge, needs to have fire knowledge. Clearly, needs to also be able to liaise with uh, with with residents and so on. And the question is around: I mean, how have, how are you shaping the job description? How do you see uh, the role uh, going forward? And and perhaps what advice could you give? Uh, to those uh, listening in, in terms of that particular role uh, going forward. So, t Tony first. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, a great question, actually, because it's it's probably one of the most challenging roles that we've been looking to fulfil for a number of years. Um, it is obviously a, a, a new type of role that um, in some ways is not fully defined, but we've had support, again, from um, our advisors, Ridge, in terms of um, the framework of skills that are required for that to allow us to develop our job description. Um, and we're happy to always share that type of thing that we've kind of developed with, with, with others too. Um, the challenge in the role really is that one, it has a, a defined legal responsibility. So clearly the profile of the role is quite significant for, for that, uh, that level. Um, it requires the um, the person to have the technical skills and background, but also to be a great communicator and a great communicator with customers. Um, there's a significant overlap between all these things in relation to the requirements of that role in the Building Safety Bill and the changes that are underway in communication in the white paper. So our customer insight team, our housing management teams, etc. Our customer insight team and our property team uh, under myself are working closely together to make sure that we define that job description to make sure it brings together all of those areas of communication we have with customers around their housing responsibilities and our responsibilities and the building safety features. So we uh, have just started recruiting it because we're just undergoing a small program of change in the, in the group at the moment. Uh, so we've just started that recruitment um, and we think it's going to be a bit of a challenge to a point, um, but we uh, we hope certainly over the next few months that we'll have them on board um, and be able to start to move forward with it. Okay, Mark? thanks. Mark, so. Um, yeah, I uh, broadly agree in terms of uh, what, what Tony said. I mean, there is a significant challenge for our sector and the industry generally in terms of the skills gap. Uh, I don't think there's any escaping that. I think they are going to be um, in in limited supply. Um, but it's um, sorry, I've got something in my throat, and I'm going <coughs> to excuse me, do pause. Um, I mean, there is some uh, working group um, uh, recommendations in terms of competencies for building safety managers that's available from the. Uh, Construction Industry Council and and other bodies as well. Um, um, it's also noticeable that some of the job descriptions or job adverts that have been placed by providers uh, there's quite a wide range in terms of uh, what what they're seeking to find. But it it is a challenging role, as Tony said. It is almost FM plus, um, so you need that sort of technical 
um, aspects, understanding how a building works, the risks and managing those, as well as dealing with um, resident uh, engagement, etc. That's why I think some clients are potentially looking at as, as it being a role that's split between two individuals rather than just one individual. Um, I mean, the, the 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 bigger issue in terms of uh, the committee's uh, review also is is providing more guidance. Um, there there isn't really uh, as much guidance as as necessary, and the working group uh, also uh, recommended that that uh, competency and help to appointing uh, building safety managers uh, is you know there's more information provided because obviously remembering that the uh, building safety regulator will have the power to remove building safety managers that they don't think are competent so it will be over overseen by them uh, so you know we can't really afford to get the wrong people in because they may get removed so uh, yeah so yeah. there's a couple of other angles to consider as well okay thanks uh, thanks phil uh yeah i, I guess i have a a different insight to Tony and Mark. I have previously been an FM and currently being a member of the IWFM and I'm also head of head of assets in for a number of landlords. So dare I I just had a look at a couple of the job boards as, as Tony and Mark were looking there and there's a number of jobs advertised. Let's say North of England seems to be 50k is the is the sort of going rate is advertised, but interesting how they get filled and, and London South East slightly more than that. I guess I look at the challenge for how much you load into a job. You, 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 you want someone with responsibility, someone senior, accountable, so you, you can pay slightly more money for that. Um, they're going to need the, the relevant skill, knowledge, experience. Uh, and I think the draw will be from different angles, different directions. That's going to require actually you might have to accept these people are going to be training so you look you're seeing level four qualifications how many people have that as well as the inclination etc cetera, etc cetera. but i do think that things have moved on you know tony did a really good job earlier of setting up the processes and systems that exist for fire safety and i think uh, the housing sector has had enough for gas for, for many many years but when you move into other areas of compliance the infrastructure didn't exist and if you'd have asked me five years ago, would you consider it? Even 10 years ago, I'd have said, probably uh, with that level of responsibility, you, you know, you'd have to double those salaries. And, 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 and it's on the basis that you're asking individuals to take a lot of responsibility. You've got some big roles there, um, but without the support, without the priorities, without the funding, without in, in the infrastructure. And I think all those things have followed since Grenfell. You, you know, you've got the boards that are interested. You've got the infrastructure, the, the funding that, that go in place to deliver that. So all the components that enable those individuals to do their job um, and the cultural shift has, is happening, I think is possible. So they are going to be in short demand um, and, and, and just the nature of probably those people don't exist right now. And you'll be asking if you'll do other jobs to, to transfer into those roles. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, it'll be a challenge, but I think people will do it. Um, uh, I, I do wonder whether uh, uh, trying to com combine that resident liaison piece with the accountable piece, it, it was all identified with consultation that was always going to be a challenge, um, but um, not impossible, I wouldn't say. Okay, a couple of points just 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 to pick on and and in, in in terms of the next question, but but again, I think all all three of you have have, have mentioned this, and and that you know it was a it's a specific uh, question for 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 Tony, which which is around you know to some extent, you know, well the exact quote, you know why do you think the or, the organisation uh, waited or or you know learned of its downgrade uh, before taking action, and again having known some of the background, I'm not quite sure that's fair. But I think what is uh, fair to uh, to address is around how you think you've changed the culture within uh, the organisation and, and in particular the attitudes of, of, of the board towards safety. Because again, I, I still think that there is, again, as Phil just said, still a, a journey that people uh, need to go on to understand uh, and, and to get that change in, uh, change in attitude towards fire safety. Tony. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I I, um, I can certainly say that we, we didn't wait for our, our downgrade to do anything, um, certainly not. And it's not a case of that actually we weren't doing anything, even at the time of the having received the um, fire risk assessments and the actions that were required at the building that was 
uh, was photographed in my slide. And um, what we were doing was we weren't doing it quickly enough. And that's a, that's a, a given and that, that's nothing I'm going to shy away from. And we weren't being transparent enough about how we were taking action uh, or communicating that well. Um, so we, we received, for example, the downgrade in October 2018, and we started our comprehensive FRA programme in, in January 2019, so that we didn't um, sit and wait about to, to, to recognise that we wanted to be 100% certain around what the position of our estate was. Um, we had to put in place a, a, a procurement route to do that, um, get that mobilised, and then get that done in a very short time scale. So, um, so we certainly um, didn't sit around and wait for it. That, that, that's a certainty. Um, the board that is now in place in the housing group, um, none of those are original members that were there at Nosley Housing Trust. And that has been um, not just a, a, a process of um, looking to improve um, the strength and skills of our board, but also recognising the level and scale of change that we've gone through. And um, one of the challenges that we had faced as an organisation was that we had very successfully diversified our business activities, but we had lost some focus on our core purpose. And what we've done within this new live housing group and on, under our new board is refocused on our core activity, which is our housing provision. Um, and that itself has led to a significant cultural change. Um, one of the things we did as part of a voluntary undertaking when we were being downgraded was we, we undertook a culture survey. And one of the great outcomes and successes we found from that cultural survey was the, the question that scored the highest from almost every employee in the group, almost 500 employees, was that our strength sat in our openness and transparency around health and safety. And I was even surprised at the strength of the, the scoring that our employees gave that, that in our culture survey. But it showed how much we had shifted in our openness and transparency around wanting to address issues and putting in place mechanisms to allow people to bring those things forward and allow us to address them and move on together. So I think culturally we've changed fundamentally from, from where we were at the time. And it does require every person in the group to make that happen. Thanks uh, very much. Mark, do, do, do you want to, any comments on, on changing the culture within organisations? Um, well, it's it's something that I always believe, whether it's fire safety related or other compliance areas or other other areas, to get to get that shift and cultural movement, um, you've got to bring people on a on a journey with you and a, on a and without sounding too much like a consultant, um, it is bringing people on and getting their buy in and and their want to take you from where you are now to where you want to be. So I think I think that's very much part of that process because if you try and change things without that you're you're destined to fail um and and obviously you know that cultural shift and and what have you as, as i was saying in the presentation you know that's not all within the internal team you know that's got to be reflective of externals whether it's consultants like us or contractors uh residents etc everyone's got to want to move to that to that position and and feel part of that uh, process and be engaged in it that's that's the way I think that you know you can make that real difference and and shift. Phil, thanks, Andrew. Um, I, I reflected on this when you asked the question, and I wasn't quite expecting a, a cultural question. And I, I, it took me back probably six or seven years to to hearing on the radio that, um, that, that the evening before there'd been a fire in a block of flats. Uh, in the in the West Midlands, um, and, and your, your immediate instinct is, is that one of ours? Um, and, and to think about the, the people that have lost their lives through that process. Um, I mean, on occasion, I was very fortunate, I think is the phrase I would say, it wasn't one of our buildings. Um, and, 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 and from a selfish perspective, you think, great, we, we've dodged a bullet. Um, but when you know that things are not right, actually the thing to do is just speak up and, and put those things right. And, 
when when the the coroner asks the question of a landlord and says, "Well, how much would it have taken for you to have saved those lives?" And in the case of let's say an electrical test, and the landlord says, "Well, it's seventy five pounds." Um, you know, morally and ethically, you, you can't not do those works and you can't not do those things. I think from a cultural perspective, um, it takes time to put the things in place. You, you know, we have Graham Fell, so you have the knee-jerk reaction, um, but we haven't given people the training at that point, we haven't given people the skills. People probably know they're not compliant, but can they speak up? Have you created the right environment? For me, it comes down to leadership. I think that transparency is a great way of of having that open and honest conversation and if you're not yet compliant you know that be honest say that and then you can focus on moving forward and putting those things right and, and dealing with the issues rather than constantly sort of ignore not ignoring but but trying to gloss over the white elephant in the room and and i think that, that we, we as a sector housing is nearly there but there are there are plenty of people that still have huge programs of works they still need to do and i think until they get a bit closer to compliance are they quite ready to be that transparent and, and i'm and i'm not sure so i think there's a combination of time in between well we've only really recently been defining those competencies and telling people what they are so everyone's been in this very uncertain zone um, but I don't think we're too far off sort of saying, well, we, we've defined the competencies, we've given people the training, we've fixed the buildings, and actually at the point where um, people feel more comfortable about being open. Um, and I think go, go back so only two or three years and, and it was very clear people weren't comfortable. And I think that's a good indicator of how uh, culture has changed. And, and I think leadership will be more comfortable with that as well, because, you know, reputational risk, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, there are valid risks for businesses, but it will also impact on the culture of organisations and, and, and landlords. So uh, I'd say good good progress has been made. We see that. We see that in our members. We see that in the way that they ask inquiries, the way they share information, the way they behave, the things they do, the way the offices are acting. We've certainly seen a shift, but, um, you know, th there's still more to do. Okay, just in terms of moving on to the next session, but but in some respects, an associated theme, which to some extent is around what what we might describe as as the culture of suppliers. So again, there's a there's a direct question about the you know, and 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 with 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 all respect to open open reach and Virgin Media, but it may also be other contractors working within buildings. And again, we've all seen. Uh, photographs of, of of holes in in, in floors and fire stopping uh, and so on how do we also change the culture of suppliers uh, towards that whole building safety I, I'll, I'll stick with you phil and then perhaps tony uh, and and then mark so, so so you know from a fusion perspective how do you ensure that suppliers fully understand you know the importance of uh, of safety when they're undertaking uh, works within building sure it, it's a tricky one if you if you, you talk about open reach and people like that you, you know they're third parties and necessarily signed an agreement and and landlords don't always have direct control of buildings they don't necessarily have a permanent presence on site um, so the direct supply chain within your control i think is the easy one it's, it, it's in grasp it's within your gift that's around i would start off with good contracting good contract management make sure you set out the terms uh, we see more and more landlords taking a holistic approach to contracting. So all of their contractors working to the same terms, to the same roles, um, the right quality assurance, monitoring processes, contract management to, to, to oversee that, um, and training their staff to know what's right and what's wrong, um, uh, and, and the rules around whether you know, contractors are required to their own fire stopping, they must be created to do that, or whether they're to produce a schedule that others will do after, after they've been around. So, I think that bit's within grasp, that's around good procurement, good contracting. I think the third party contractors uh, is definitely an issue uh, and I'd be interested in, in Tony's answer on this one. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, that's probably my answer. Yeah, okay, Tony. <laughs> uh, yes, Andrew, it's, it's a, a constant battle, shall I say. Um, we've Over the last few years, we've certainly strengthened considerably our permit to work process so that when um the likes of of open reach will go in and um want to start bashing holes through through buildings 
that they have a, a comprehensive understanding of what our expectations are from them. Um, that's easier to manage in some respects on high rise buildings because we have a more regular, if not constant presence on site where we can monitor that. Um, whereas in, in other buildings, they can on occasion turn up without us knowing. Um, we have to address that through regular audits where we know they are there. Um, we um, make clear to them what our expectations are before they start and we audit their work before they've finished and make sure they've got certification around compartmentation of they've, they've, they've repaired, etc. Um, but it is a it's an ongoing battle to just keep checking areas to make sure that um, no damage has been done and, and, and no additional risk has been introduced. Yeah. I'd love to say Thank you. Mark, have you a final comment? Um, I think uh, the industry has always had that issue around uh, dive, dive, you know, the divergence between uh, trying to to make to make money on contracts with very small margins in construction um, versus quality, pride in the work, uh, the old apprenticeship schemes, etc. So we are certainly seeing more push towards uh, the old clerk of works overseeing uh, 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 refurbishment work and, and cladding renewals, etc. Um, some of the investigation work we've done uh, in terms of cladding, you know, uh, no fire breaks, different materials than, than specified as in, and included on book drawings, etc. Um, so the, there is a degree at the moment um, of more supervision and um, increasing the scope of um, things like contract administrators, employers, agents, uh, principal designers, etc., cetera, um, to, to make sure that, you know, work is better policed, but also making sure that, you know, we accept the fact or accepting the fact that, um, you know, contractors, if they're going to be doing this sort of thing, will, will be expected to, to be paid for it. And then trying to get that culture of not, not sort of cutting corners. Um, so part of that, particularly in high risk buildings uh, for us, has been around things like fire stopping it has to be evidence tagged uh, and included on on uh, on sort of BIM level two type drawings um, and understanding and provision of that information at the outset before contractor starts work to make sure they understand. You know, they are making penetrations through compartment walls. Therefore, you know, they need to consider uh, the fire safety ratings between each side and what level of fire stopping they need to do. And going back to that point, I think Tony made about, you know, they have to be qualified uh, and certified to be able to undertake that type of work. So it's, you know, it's it's that it's that focus and sort of policing role, um, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, we aren't continually racing to the bottom. And part of that does come back to the culture of, you know, you know, we really want quality, we really want quality and we'll assess it 20 percent of the bid and 80 percent on price sending the wrong sort of message um so i think you know there, there's sort of some immediate thoughts in terms of um you know how, how we address that sort of problem okay thanks thanks very much i'm, I'm conscious of time and we are going to sort of finish it at, at half past so we've probably got 30 seconds in 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 which to do it so so, so one very final uh question to the panel and and, and to some extent a one word or or, or one sentence answer uh, and I'm 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 gonna gonna start with with you, with you, Mark. If if there's one piece of advice for for our audience to take away in in, in relation to this, um, what would it be? Don't underestimate um, the size of the task. Thank you, Phil. Can I let Tony go next? <laughs> That's not an answer. <laughs> Tony. Oh, it's Tony there. Muted, Tony. I uh, hope you got me eventually. Um, so be transparent with your people in your business, with your customers and with your stakeholders. Excellent. And then Phil. I, I think I've got mine. And, and I think it's about um, focus on data. It's short as that. So, so uh, without that golden thread, you can't evidence anything. Um, you can't have a culture where you, you don't know. It all starts from information. You, you know, if you're installing fire breaks and new builds, where's the data to prove it? So uh, technology has come a long way. Data is the answer. Brilliant. And that segments us perfectly, although we're almost scripted, into uh, a final reminder of tomorrow's uh, webinar, which is exactly on uh, on that, on that uh, topic. 
So finally, it just leaves me to say thank you to the audience for listening. There were a couple of questions that we didn't get through, um, and, and I will ask the, the, the panel to uh, review those questions afterwards, and we'll, we'll send through uh, those responses. Uh, so a big thank you to you for listening. A big thank you uh, to uh, Mark, to Tony, uh, and to Phil for their presentations and for their uh, q and I think it was a really great uh, session. Uh, and again, uh, look forward to seeing you all again. And please do visit our website if you, if you want to uh, sign up for tomorrow's webinar and then uh, the launch, the official launch of the Building Safety and Compliance Framework uh, next week. So thank you all. Have a great uh, afternoon and hope to see you all soon. Bye bye.